So before we start off on creating that effect uh, that we've just seen, let's have a quick look in more detail at how instancing works in Houdini. And I've got a scene here set up uh, with this arrow object, which we can see is aligned with the big arrow pointing along the z-axis, and then a smaller arrow along the x-axis, and a long thin arrow along the y-axis. And I've got a pop network set up here, and I've got a copy node. And we're going to get onto that in a minute. So for the moment, I'm going to put our display flag on the pop network. And you can see that I've set up our display options to display the particle axes here that are attached to a particle that I've got inside my pop network. Let me just show you how to do that. So with your cursor over the 3D view, you hit the D key. And that brings up the display options and the particle nomon, as it's called, is turned on and off with this option here and you can control its size with this option here and often you need to scale it up quite a lot to be able to see it. You can also turn it on using a button here uh, on the side of the 3D view uh, which gives us the same thing. So what have we got inside our pop network? Well we've just got a very simple location pop and I've given my, I'm just birthing a single particle at the first frame and I'm giving it a velocity of 1 in the upwards y direction. So we can see that moving. So as uh, you know, in order to instance an object on a point, we need to go to our particles shelf and find the instance tool, select the instance tool and it invites us first to select the object so I'm going to select my arrow and then it invites me to ensure that the node which contains my particle network is configured to render point instances. Now this sets up also an instance node here which is referring to the arrow and we can see that the arrow, when it's instance, is pointing with the large arrow pointing upwards in the y direction. And the reason the large arrow is pointing upwards in the y direction is that by default, the instance defines the orientation of the geometry that it's instancing using the particle axes velocity and up vector. Well, we'll come to up vector in a moment, but velocity under this system of orientation, velocity determines the z-axis. So in this case, my velocity is heading up straight up in the y direction. So my object's z-axis is being instanced so that that points up in the y direction. And so the large arrow points up in the y direction. If I change my velocity, so for example, it points in the uh, x direction, we can see that the large arrow now points in the x direction. So what does it mean velocity and up vector? Well the up vector is a slightly misleading name uh, and you can see that there's a node, a pop node, which allows you to define the up vector. So let's lay one of those down and let's delete these channels. And let me give myself an up vector of 1, 0, 0 and I may need to rewind my uh, and of course that's the same as the uh, let, let's revert our velocity back to being in the so we can now see uh, that with uh, the velocity pointing straight up our so-called up vector pointing along the x-axis this is the orientation of our arrow shape if I switch off the up vector which reverts it back to its default, we can see that that's rotating the arrow. So the up vector and the velocity are defining completely the orientation of our object when it's instance. Let me try using a different value for the up vector. And we can now see we get yet another orientation. So in effect, uh, this up vector is rotating our object around the y-axis as we change uh, the the value of the up vector. If the up vector and the velocity are pointing in the same direction, then the up vector will have no effect. Uh, 
So let's have a look at the other method of orientating instance geometry. Uh, and that's to use the fixed axis method. And what the fixed axis method does is it ignores the up vector and the velocity and simply orients the geometry in the same way that the original geometry is oriented. And as you can see here, that's an exact copy of the orientation of the original geometry. You can, however, change the orientation, and you do that by defining an axis, and here I've defined the y-axis, and an angle of rotation, and that allows you to rotate, as you can see, the geometry. Uh, and that changes the axes. And just to demonstrate that the up vector doesn't make any difference, I'll disable that, and I'll also change the direction of our velocity. And again, that hasn't made a difference. Well, uh, let's have a look at a details view just to show what's going on. And the instance node here has created this new four component attribute orient. And you can't set this by hand really because this is a quaternion rather than simply a, a rotation and it reflects uh, this axis and this angle of rotation. Well, let's now look, uh, instead of instancing, at copying. And just a reminder of the difference between instancing and copying. Instancing is a process which happens at render time. It's done by Mantra as the scene is being rendered. So uh, Houdini sends to Mantra a copy of the scene which does not contain an instance of the geometry at every single point it just contains the points and the object to be instanced and an instruction to the renderer to instance that geometry on the points. And that instruction to the renderer is actually expressed up here uh, at the top level node where we can see that the shelf tool, one of the things the shelf tool did when we uh, used it to set up instancing, has created this attribute point instancing and turned it on here on our geometry node uh, and if we have a look here standard geometry node doesn't have that tab doesn't have that property and that's one of the reasons why it's a good idea to use the shelf tool the shelf instance tool to set up instancing on particles uh, because if you don't do that uh, you won't get this attribute set up for you and you may then wonder why mantra is not behaving as it should is not rendering the instances that you expect Let's now have a look at copying. So I'm going to turn off my instance node. Let's turn back on the up vector. Uh, and let's uh, actually revert this velocity so that it's going in the y direction. Uh, and let's have a look and see what the copy node, uh, the copy node does. And we can see that this is working pretty much identically to the way the instance node works when it's defining the orientation using velocity. So the big arrow points in the direction of our velocity, which is upwards. Uh, and if we change the up vector, let's just uh, change this to something like that, we can see that that changes the orientation of our geometry. But Copy takes into account uh, another attribute which you don't normally use in a particle situation uh, but you can create on your particle so let me just create an attribute and I'm going to give it uh, I'm going to call it n for normal and we're going to make it a vector and I'm going to give it a value of 1 it's going to point along the x direction uh, and I need to change my up vector to point along the z direction. Uh, and we can see now uh, that rather than our big arrow pointing in the direction of velocity, it's pointing in the direction of the normal. And what's happening here is that the copy node looks first of all for a normal. And when it finds a normal, it uses that together with the up vector to define the orientation of the copy. If it can't find a normal, it then looks for velocity and uses that to define the orientation of the copy. And by the way, all of this is de 
is is dependent on having this parameter here enabled transform using template point attributes if we turn that off we just get a direct copy of our original geometry so first of all it looks for a normal if it doesn't find a normal it looks for velocity and it defines the orientation using those what happens if it finds an orient attribute uh, and now we're using the fixed axis method if it finds an orient attribute we can see that it simply uses that it, it ignores the normal it ignores the out vector it ignores the velocity and it just uses that orient attribute to define the orientation of the geometry well let's have a look now at how you would go about changing the rotation or the orientation of your object over time uh, using attributes on particles and there are two pop nodes uh, that allow you to do this the first one is the rotation pop so let's set that up and the rotation pop allows you to set up an angle in my case I'm just going to make it the y-axis and a rotation and as we can see as we increase this rotation changes the orientation of our instance geometry and by the way this works identically when you're using copying rather than instancing so what happens if I wanted to instance around a second axis what would happen if I set up a second rotation? So let's put one in. Uh, let's, in this case, rotate about the x-axis. And let me give myself a quite large angle. Let's say 180, that's fine. And we can see that that is uh, rotating around the x-axis. Uh, but what is happening, in fact, is that these rotation nodes are not uh, additive so it usually doesn't make any sense to have two rotation nodes in your pop network at least if both of them are applying to the same points at the same time so if I bypass my first rotation node uh, which if you'll recall is a 180 degree rotation around the y-axis it doesn't matter what value it is uh, nothing happens and that's because the second rotation node is overriding the first another method of changing the rotation of your objects over time is to use angular velocity and if I delete channels let's have some angular velocity around the y-axis and give myself an angular velocity of say 80 uh, we can see that this rapidly rotates around the y-axis as time goes on if I were to set up a rotation pop again rotating around the y-axis and giving myself a particular orientation we can see that the rotation pop is preventing the angular velocity from working uh, because in effect it's setting a fixed rotation at every frame and that's overriding the angular velocity so you can't also use angular velocity and rotation at the same time in the same pop network and just to demonstrate uh, let's turn that off and let's go back up to copy instead of instance and we can see that the copy node also takes count of that rotation and just to show how that rotation looks uh, we can see that there is this rot attribute here set up on our points and again this is a quaternion you can't usually edit this by hand so that's a quick summary of the different ways of orienting geometry on points or on particles in Houdini. Uh, here's a summary of uh, the methods. And let's now move on to our example. Well, let's now move to our more complicated example. And just to say this example is based on one of the example files that comes with 
3 DS Max 2011 and I just wanted to use the example in part to comment about how you can transfer effects from particle flow which is the default particle system in 3ds max over to Houdini and uh, how some of the concepts translate so I've started off with the basics of our scene so we've got a ground plane I'm using that as a source for some particles uh, I've got this box uh, which is just a proxy for our car and I've animated it so that between frames 1 and 50 it drives through the center of our scene and we've got some leaf geometry which is being copied to the points of our pop network it's being copied here uh, and at the moment the pop network is just a source pop which is birthing 500 particles at the first frame only those particles are staying where they are because they're using inherited velocity there's no inherited velocity so uh, they're just staying where they are and we're using the ground plane as our source and we're sourcing from random points on the surface so at the moment nothing very interesting is happening one of the differences between Houdini and particle flow is that particle flow has the concept of events for example the particles start off being part of an event which is then spread across the ground and as particles enter or collide with uh, our proxy geometry representing the car they move into another event uh, in which some wind is applied to them so they rise off the ground and in particle flow you can do things uh, when particles enter an event when they first enter an event and you can also apply continue applying uh, some forces for example to them throughout the time that they're in the event uh, and you can achieve some of the same things using groups in Houdini so let's just demonstrate how you do that uh, and I'll lay down a group node and I'm going to call this just in car and let's use this dollar OS so we're going to create a group called just in car and I'm going to use a bounding box and I'm going to use a bounding object and we're going to use obviously a car proxy so what this should mean is that say halfway through here uh, we have we can just see 17 points in just in car so these are just the points which are inside uh, this bounding box But I may also want to have a set of points which represent all of the points that have ever been inside this bounding box. So I can set up another group and I can call this all in car. And again I'm going to use $OS as the name so that the group name takes its name from the name of the node and this time I'm going to select preserve group now what I could do is repeat the bounding box calculation but that's a little bit unnecessary so what I instead I can do is use this combine node and I can say $OS equals $OS uh, that's just setting the, the group to equal itself and then I can union that with the just in car group so what that will mean is that this group adds at every frame uh, the particles which have just entered the bounding box or are inside the bounding box but because we've got preserve group on those particles will always stay inside this group even once they've left the bounding box so what we should see is that We've got eight points in just in car but we've got a hundred and five points in uh, the group that contains all of the particles that are in the car so now we've got those groups set up let's do something with them uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is add some wind and I'm going to give us some upward wind uh, quite strong and I'm going to add some low frequency noise 
this gives a frequency of 0.4 and an amplitude of 7. And what this should do, and you see what's happening is it's actually applying to all of the particles. And of course we want it just to apply to the ones that are inside the bounding box. So as this goes on, those fly up. I'm just going to reduce that uh, a little bit. Let's give it a value of 2. So as you can see, as they enter the bounding box, they fly up. And the other thing I'm going to do is reduce the Y component of the noise. Like so. Then what we need to do is to have a countervailing force. And let's start with a value of minus 1 here and see how we go. Uh, which, and again, I've made the mistake of not applying this. I'm going to apply this to all of the particles that have ever been inside that bounding box. And we can see that this now causes those particles to drop away. And we need something for them to collide with. So let's introduce our ground plane again. And we do that uh, using a collision pop. And we can select the object we want to collide with, which is the ground. And I'm going to stop the particles on, stick them on collision. Let's try that. So what should happen is that they should stick back down. Some of them are falling through. That There's a collision detection issue there, but in general they're sticking back down. So that's the basics of our animation. Uh, but as we can see uh, in a moment, uh, there are some problems with it. And let's go back up and have a look at this with our leaves instanced to our points. And we can see as the leaves enter the bounding box, let's have a look here, we can see as soon as they enter the bounding box, their orientation changes. And that's not necessarily very sensible uh, because uh, you're going to get this sudden change in orientation of the leaves. So we need to make sure and I'm going to do this using an instance pop, uh, that we are not taking account of velocity when we choose the orientation of our instance geometry. So I'm going to change this to fixed axis, and I think let's try using the y-axis as our axis. And although we haven't uh, established any geometry to instance here, and because we haven't got that particle instance geometry uh, flag set, on the top level geometry node, this isn't actually going to cause Mantra to instance any geometry. All it's going to do is set up that orient attribute uh, in a way which will be useful for this copy sop. So what we should now find is that our leaves retain their orientation. Uh, and that up to a point is good news because we've avoided the problem of them suddenly shifting direction, but it doesn't look very realistic that they all retain exactly the same orientation. So one of the things uh, that we need to do is introduce a bit of angular velocity. So let's do that up here when we're applying our wind. And I'm going to apply some angular velocity. And I'm going to use a random axis. So I'm going to take random dollar ID, then random dollar ID plus some number, and rand dollar ID plus some other number. And that will give a random axis of rotation for each particle. And I'm also going to randomize the velocity. 
brand dollar ID plus something. And I'm going to use the fit01 function again to give us, say, a random angular velocity between 20 and 60. Let's have a look at what that looks like. So what we should see now is, ah, and I've made the mistake of uh, applying this to everything when I just want to apply it to the things that are in the bounding box. So let's have a look at this. And we can see that now our leaves are rotating randomly. A couple of problems with it, uh, which you'll see which is that even when they hit the ground, they continue to rotate, which is, of course, unrealistic. So let's see whether we can try and fix that. Well, we fix that uh, here in the POP network by adding in a collision group. So let's have a collision group called Just Collided. And for good measure, although we may not need it, let's have a group which is called All Collided. And this time I'm going to preserve the group. So this group, Just Collided, is going to be things that have hit the ground this frame. All collided is going to be everything that's ever hit the ground. And I'm going to combine, as before, $OS equals $OS, and then the union with the just collided group. And obviously, one of the things I'm going to need to do is stop that angular rotation. So let's add another angular velocity node. Now, WX, WY, and WZ, these variables are going to be set to the axis of rotation. So they can stay as they are. And I'm going to set the velocity to zero. So this is going to look up what the axis of rotation for that particular particle was, and then set the velocity to zero. Let's have a look and see whether that now works. And we can see this more properly up at this level. So as this goes, and uh, have I? And of course, uh, what I've done is set it to zero for everything rather than for the just collided group. So let's see whether this now works. So that's revolving round, and when they hit, they are ceasing to revolve. Uh, but we've now got a second uh, problem, uh, which is they're landing at these weird angles, which, which is not realistic. So let's have a look now at how to resolve that. And this illustrates another technique uh, with particles, which is how to have a particle respond to something in a time scale which was related to an event. And what we want to do here is have those leaves which have hit the ground gradually turn back to facing directly upwards by uh, reference to the time at which they hit the ground. So the uh, first thing that we need to do is ensure that we are setting up a hit time attribute. So this is going to make sure that when our particles hit the ground uh, they have this time attribute. And then we can use that to change our orientation, our rotation. So let me have a rotation pop. And I'm going to apply this to all collided. I'm going to leave these rotation axes as they are. And the thing that I also need to do is know what angle those uh, leaves are at when they hit the ground. So the other thing I need to do 
is to create an attribute and let's call this HA. HA is going to be the angle at which they hit the ground. So it's going to be a float and I'm going to give it a value of rot A, which is the angle of rotation. So we're going to apply this to just in car. Sorry, not just in car, that's wrong. We're going to apply it to just collided. So this attribute will be created as soon as those leaves collide with the ground. So this is the angle at which those leaves are when they hit the ground. And what we then want to do is rotate those leaves back to having a zero rotation over a certain time. So as I said before, this is going to be their axis of rotation. We can just leave that as it is and we need to delete these channels and we need to have dollar ha which is the hit angle uh, the 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 angle of rotation at the point they hit and we want to start with that uh, as the angle and then over say half a second uh, we want to revert back to that angle being zero so that the leaves should point in the way they did when they were lying on the ground so let's start by 1 minus, we're timesing this by 1 minus, and then we want dollar $t, which is the time, minus dollar $hit time. So when uh, the particle collides with the ground, this value hit time is established. And then that very frame, the value of t and the value of hit time will be the same. And then as uh, we move away from that time, as we go further on in our simulation, the value of t, dollar $t will increase, and thus the value of 1 minus this whole expression will decrease uh, to 0. Our problem is that as time goes on, this is going to eventually become, uh, this whole expression is eventually going to become negative, and you're going to have your leaves rotating in the opposite direction. So what we want is this always to be above zero. So I'm going to make it an expression max, what we've got there, and zero. So this is always going to be in the range one to zero. And let's see whether that's worked. So let's go up again. Uh, before I do that, of course, this has got to be up there that's fine okay let's see whether that now works these rotate around they hit and then as you can see they move back to lying flat To my mind, a final thing that's wrong with this scene is that our leaves all point in the same direction. Uh, and because of the difficulty I mentioned earlier about combining rotation pops in a single pop network, I'm actually going to handle this at uh, the copy SOP point in our scene. And I'm going to do so by creating a stamp input and I'm going to give it a variable, what I'm going to call it y rot, let's say, and we're going to make it equal to rand dollar pt plus something times 360. Uh, and then I'm going to stamp our individual leaves using a transform and I'm going to rotate around the y-axis this stamp expression which needs to refer to our copy sop it needs to refer to our attribute that we've just set up or our variable y rot 
and it needs to give it a default value, which is zero. And we can now see that each of our leaves has a random uh, rotation, and those then maintain their random position as the leaves are blown up by the passing car.